All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Watch This with Rick Ramos. As always, it's your host, Rick Ramos. I am here, and uh, we, uh, my, my co-host, Mr. Ibrahim Chavez, has joined me this week. We're excited to be getting into, uh, well, to give a little mini celebration to one of the great directors of the 1970s who passed two weeks ago, two, maybe three weeks ago, uh, at the age of 87, Mr. William Friedkin, uh, director of such classics as... The Exorcist, The French Connection, Cruising, To Live and Die in L.A. Um, as with most directors, there's a falling off point, and the 1990s were a real, were a real hit and miss, mostly miss series of of bad choices, Blue Chips, Jade, a couple of other films. But he would come back strong in 2013 with a film that I think is probably one of the best exclamation points to any person's um any director's film career now some people would argue that he made one more film about um uh, a documentary about exorcism but for all intents and purposes this is the film that would cap billy friedkin's uh four or five decade career and there was a film called killer joe now let's be Let's be forewarned at this point. This is a very difficult film. It is a film of disturbing imagery, disturbing acts of violence, sexual violence, physical violence. And um, as always, it is impossible for us to discuss a movie without talking about damn near every aspect of the film. I mean, this is what we're doing. I say this knowing that there's a great many of the listening audience who may not have ever seen this film. If that is the case, and if you have not seen Killer Joe, turn off the podcast now and uh, rent it, buy it, stream it, whatever the fuck you got to do. Watch it before we go into detail of every aspect of what happens. Because we're going to reveal some very shocking things and... The shock is, this is not a shock value type of film, but shock value is an element of the viewing experience, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Mr. Chavez, I'm so pleased that you could uh, you could be here. I'm thrilled that we're talking, and uh, what's your opinion on Friedkin's Killer Joe? His, um... Thank you. His um, this film makes me struggle with uh, with his filmography. Really. And really. Hmm. What well, what that means is that his the struggle is 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 trying to make sense of the ups and downs. Yeah. Um, and I get it. Um, I get the. We kind of talked about this when we did the Val Kilmer stuff. It's like, um, yeah, when you shoot, when you're talented and you, but you're an asshole and you shoot yourself in the foot, um, then your options are extremely limited. Um, and so you make shittier choices based on the ones that you have, and then, um, etc. Um, but I look at. And we've talked about. We've talked about. The Exorcist. We talked about Sorcerer. Um, we're going to talk about more of his films. Um, we haven't talked about French Connection, but we will. Um, and these are we, these you great... know what? It's such a powerful film that it has come up numerous times throughout our working together. And um, I know it was prevalent in our in our in our seventies episode. It's the type of film, The French Connection. It it's the type of film that is that is so monumental that I'm really surprised that we haven't talked about it at this point. Yeah, I mean, it's you know? just one of those things that is kind of like um, there are a lot of those that we haven't talked about that are sure. great films. Yeah, um, definitely. But you know, we will hopefully. Um, but then, and we've talked about cruising, which yeah. was a a falling off, mm-hmm. um, and we'll continue to to explore his filmography and and 
you think of these great, these high points in a, in a director's uh, career. Um, you know, a couple months back, we did an episode with based on him, uh, a documentary on him, a documentary on um, Sidney Lumet. Sidney Lumet and uh, De Palma. De Palma, the the man up the stairs. Mm -hmm. um, and the ups and downs, the twists and turns, the inconsistency of the quality of films, the film choices, but also the quality. And to try to see, like, does this person have a style? It doesn't seem to be a visual style. Um, and then to kind of ex not expect very much and then for him to come back. Um, and so that's the struggle I'm talking about. It's like the kind of, you know you're dealing with a great director, um, but you just, you're not sure that he's really doing great things anymore. Um, and then, and then to, you know, it's like De Niro now. <laughs> it's kind of like, well, do I think that he's going to do something great? No, I don't. Not anymore. Does he still, has he still come back and done stuff? Yes, he has. Um, McConaughey kind of be, was the, kind of the opposite. Um, people think of his career in terms of like, um, or you, you know, you read about his career and it kind of, seems to be, okay, breakout star from Dazed and Confused, early to mid-90s, right? Richard Linklater. <laughs> He's worse than, um, you know, that guy. Yeah. The guy that we all know. Um, well, then it's kind of like we have this idea of that guy became the guy with no shirt in rom-coms. And then something happened. Um, the way I see it is kind of well. For a while, I mean, it, it was his career was also very inconsistent because he was he wasn't just doing rom coms. He was doing like he did Lone Star, he did A Time to Kill, Contact, Amistad. He did stuff that he kind of this young idealistic. Well, he would do prestige. He would things. play those characters. Yeah, he was. He was always very good. You know, this, this is the thing about Matthew McConaughey. He has a certain charm in his early days, and we'll talk about this when we do an episode on Tom Cruise and John Wayne. There was a point where I thought, Matthew McConaughey is a movie star. I didn't think much of him as an actor. Um, although Dazed and Confused is one of the great breakout debut performances in a film. I mean, if you go back and you watch it now, I think... It's it's both creepy and charming and very real and honest to guys like that. Um, kind of like Killer Joe. Yes, it's it's that that is the quality that Matthew McConaughey brings to a project is that he is able to play somebody who is unabashedly just fucking. I don't know if he's, he is the most evil person in a film filled with unlikable characters. The really interesting thing about this film is... For this film. What's that? For Killer Joe. For this particular for film, this, yeah. For this particular film, one of the interesting things, or at least it's interesting to me, is that there is not a single character in this film that is noble, um, honest, good... There, is, there are no quality people in this film. There is nobody to root for. There is nobody to say, yes, this is a good person. Everybody in this film is varying degrees of horrible. Not bad, horrible. These are horrible people. And yet, as I watch this film, I'm intrigued by the story that's being told. Now, when I was watching it last night, I was, and I hadn't seen it since it, I was, I said 2013, it came out in 2011. And I think I saw it, I either saw it with 
my good friend Mike Blacker, I saw it with you. I can't remember if I, I can't remember who I saw it with. I know I saw it at the Landmark Theater in um, Santa Monica. That much I remember. I, I feel like I saw it once with you. Um, that Then that would have been the only know. time that I saw it because when I went to my shelf to pick it up off the shelf to watch it, I thought, oh, I've seen this since it came out. The cellophane was still on the, on the, on the DVD. It was still on the Blu-ray. So I was like, wow, I haven't seen this since 2011. And yet images stuck with me all the while that I'm watching it. It's coming back to me. Images are there, but scenes are not. Does that make any sense? Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, I've had that, um, I've had that on this podcast Mm -hmm. and a lot of times the, the images are wrong. Um, yeah, um, you reshape them in your head after, especially after 12, 13 years. But l- l- before we get into let's you, let's complete the the, mm. the thought. Um, well, the, what we, I'm we changed lanes real quick. I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry. What I was going to say, it's a difficult film, and it's a film that falls into the category of films that I consider are exceptional films, and yet. I have to be careful about who I talk to them about and who I recommend them to. This falls in the same category as, especially since I'm not as young as I once was and I still, and I feel like it's important to be careful around other people's sensibilities. I can't recommend this film to most anybody in the same way that I can no longer recommend Abel Ferrara's Bad Lieutenant or Gaspar Noah's Irreversible. Um, or the, the films of, of John Waters, for that matter. Um, there is a certain type of film that, as a, as a film fan, as a cinema, as a cineast, you were drawn to the audacity, you were drawn to the, the, the power of the imagery and the balls that are needed to put the imagery on that screen in, in the story that's being told. This film is horrible in that respect. This is, there is some really horrible shit going on in this film. And I was shocked by how much of it was uncomfortable. I was sitting there actually, right? I was watching it. I had, I had the puppy in my lap. I'm watching this movie. It's 1130 at night. And I'm sitting there going, Jesus Christ, this is a rough movie. This is really um, powerful and un... (sighs) This is an uneasy watch. That being said, I can't... I couldn't... I couldn't tell my mom and dad, and my mom and dad love movies. I couldn't say, oh yeah, watch this. Whereas when I was yeah, a kid, watch I watched Rick Rommel's. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I watched, I watched like, Bad hey, Lieutenant with have, my parents back in back when I was 20. Let's you know? order some chicken. Let's yeah. get some KFC. Let's fucking sit they, 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 um, <laughs> they were delicate about, about avoiding <laughs> a lawsuit on that. <laughs> um, well, the, the thing is that it's kind of like, this is... Um, before you you took us into a fucking bad neighborhood, um, <laughs> we were talking about Matthew McConaughey's filmography. Yes, I'm sorry. Kind of yes, as a parallel right. to uh, to you're Friedkin's right. filmography. Yeah. Um, and we're gonna make that term, but you just kind of you went through somebody's fucking yard. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, it was a it was an L.A. freeway off ramp. <laughs> I just went right into a house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and I mean, and he's the point. He's kind of the, the the delicate balance there because you know freaking freaking can go to fucked up places because freaking's career is based on going to fucked up places. Yeah. yeah. Um. But um. What I was talking about is this like Matthew McConaughey's kind of young idealistic characters that he would play after the Days and Confused, and then he did the rom coms. Yeah. But while he was doing the rom-coms, he was still doing Reign of Fire, that dragon movie, mm-hmm. fucking 
frailty. He was still trying to like. Well, he was cashing paychecks, and he was he was maximizing but, his star power, which I don't. But I also don't hate trying him for to that. find himself. Yeah, I think he was trying to find himself and trying to be versatile in that process. And then, to me, I think when he kind of became Matthew McConaughey, because he now he's kind of like he has that persona, um, which. I think it's a certain element of himself that he's bringing to the, to the, to each project is the linked lawyer. I think once, once you start to get, okay, this person is now like a matured charmer who knows how to play the game, um, into killer Joe through mud, Dallas buyers club, Wolf of Wall Street, Interstellar. That's when you kind of it's like, oh, mm-hmm. this is the Matthew McConaughey that that um, has a heavier presence. Um, you know the, that show that that season that he did with Woody Harrelson, where he's did that yeah, fucking true detective, an excellent mileage. show, true detective, an excellent show in an with an excellent performance on both Harrelson and McConaughey's part, just unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and and able to go to those dark places, but still, this has this element of uh, this this charismatic element. You can tell that, but at the same time, you can still get a sense that that you're it's a put on. You're like, is this is that is he really that person? Because it's a little too slick sometimes. Um, it it it's. There's something about it. What's a little it. bit too slick? Which his his on-screen persona or his off-screen? The bongos, the shirtless, the getting high, the the physicality. Well, but but see, but I but I when you talk about the bongos and all that, which is a you know that's a throwback to James Dean and Brando and all that bullshit. Is mm-hmm. it's kind of like um, that guy was like a contemporary of the rom-com guy. Um, so. I don't know if it's the on screen or the off screen. I think there's a there's a relationship between that, you know, between those two stages, those two venues. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day or the beginning of it, um, his process of arriving at this Matthew McConaughey that we know now out of Lincoln Lawyer, which I think was kind of like the seedling of it or whatever, Killer Joe was the perfect meeting place for William Friedkin, whose career was what it was, and Matthew McConaughey's, whose career was what it was, for them to meet and to kind of each, in in a metaphor of Killer Joe, basically use each other for what they needed. Yeah. Um, to arrive at a at a at a payday, not necessarily financial. I mean, yes, financial payday, but what I mean is, um, the payday of their careers and the payday of their creative processes. Um, and now you know, it's like Friedkin's fucking persona was a little bit of a put on too brash, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's like, well, it's him, but he knows how to exaggerate it for effect. Sure. And then add in a Tracy Letts screenplay. Tracy Letts knows how to write dysfunctional families really well. One of the great dysfunctional family films of all time. I mean, August Osage County, you and I, have we've mentioned it. In the podcast, yeah. we both admire that film greatly, and um, part of it is the is the the great Meryl Streep, but um, Julia Roberts really showing oh, yeah. more than she ever really had. Juliette Lewis there, uh, Sam Sam Shepard, Sam Shepard, um, and you know Margot Martindale, just wonderful, a wonderful cast, a dis. A, but whatever dysfunction that is, that is functionally dysfunctional. This is fucked up dysfunctional. This is this is a whole other level of craziness that Tracy Letts as a playwright. And that's the thing. This was originally written as a play. 
Um, yeah. It was originally offered to Gina Gershon, and Gershon, Gershon said, in, in her own Jenna Rollins way, said, there's no way that I could have done that chicken scene eight times a week. Yeah. You know, so it was 20 years earlier, but she ends up making the film. Um, she's a great actor. I mean, I love Gina Gershon. She's so, like, cool and fucked up and dangerous yeah. and fucking and vulnerable and all, all the things that make. Um, I, I'm curious as to why she never was bigger than, than where she got. I think, you know what? We've talked about this, and there was an episode that I proposed for with you or to you about women who didn't fit the mold. The, let's be honest. This is what it is. The femme fatale period is over. Noir is practically dead. It's very difficult to get a film like that made. And three actresses that would have excelled in the 1940s and 1950s in fatale, fatale roles, the, the Barbara Stanwyck role from Double Indemnity, the, um, the Lauren Bacall roles, uh, uh, these tough-minded, dangerous women. There are three. Virginia Madsen in The Hot Spot. Uh, oh, yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. No, Linda never, Fiorentino in The Last Seduction. And um, Gina Gershon. And I think, I think there is a fear of these type of women on screen. Because, and I, I don't like to use that term, oh, we're afraid of strong women. No, these are evil women. These are fucking horrible evil women that um are very dangerous and i think that's the kind of thing that that scares studio studio executives and people who want to push forward a movie because gershon is gershon especially i think this is I haven't seen Bound, and I haven't seen all of her filmography, but from what I have mm -hmm. seen, this is one of her great performances, and she should have been nominated that year, and I'm, I'm half thinking that she should have won. She delivers a hell of a performance where she goes all out, and she is such a horrible human being that you're rooting for something bad to happen to her. And then when you see it happen, you're disgusted and you're sympathetic to her. And you switch on a dime because it's so horrible. And Friedkin directs it, especially in the unrated director's cut. Um, it is such a painful and powerful scene that is not gratuitous. It's just... It's painful. But we'll get to that. So she is, she is amazing. She should, I want to, yeah, I want to yeah. ex explore all those things in that episode that you're talking about. Because, yeah. Uh, yeah, I want to, I want to unpack some of that. Um, yeah, she's, I mean, the casting is, is, it's a perfect cast. It is. It absolutely is. Um, Emil Hirsch, I think it's, I think it's a perfect cast because, Everybody in it plays stupid very well, but in a very realistic way. At different way. levels. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because he's the smartest of the stupid guys. Mm hmm. Emil Hirsch? He's just a fuck up. Yeah, he's a yeah. fuck up. Yeah. Chris, he's a fucking, you know. And when you hear. Okay, so the basic idea of this story yeah, is. Yeah, what's the premise? The premise is Emil Hirsch plays um, a young man who's a fuck up who has screwed up his life, who is a small-time um, marijuana dealer. Maybe more things, but, you know, basically dope. And he gets kicked out of his mother's house for threatening her with violence. He goes to his father, who is shacked up with Gina Gershon, who's just a horrible, you know, town slut, I guess, but she's his wife. Um, he has a, he has a, a, a daughter, um, Dottie. Juno Temple, which it, which itself, great performance, very oh, yeah. very difficult to play somebody of this type. Where you're asking, because the character is dim witted, but very insightful, slow. Yeah, you don't know if she's you don't know if she's mentally retarded. You you're not really sure what what the hell's going on there. Are you? Were you? She's 
she's like a she she seems like a magical creature yeah in this film um she she's so innocent that yeah she doesn't seem uh, my take was kind of like she was um she was from another world yeah um and she was for whatever reason bound to this world and to this fucked up family um and she was very she seemed like a character from um uh what's his name uh fear and loathing in las vegas uh gilliam terry gilliam she yeah. seemed like something out of a gilliam um uh, film Maybe Where a grown-up version this, of Eliza Rose from Tideland, you know? Maybe, yeah. Maybe, yeah. Uh, um, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up I because mean, I, hadn't, I hadn't made that connection. That's really interesting. Yeah, with all these monsters around her and these fucked-up parents and all this and that. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you know, um, ultimately is is her her magic and her her light or whatever is dimmed and tarnished by this by her surroundings um she stands out um you, i didn't get a, i mean it, i really didn't get a sense of like i was trying to say well you know trying to do some kind of like armchair diagnosis of what's wrong with her or, or whatever it's just kind of like you know that that's the person that's kind of just doesn't belong there absolutely um, but you, you also see like there's a weird there's a strange yeah, she's different. Yeah, I wouldn't call you. You said, um, "What did you call her? Innocent." I mean, a magical is innocent? what. Is, well, the first term you used. I a, mean, magical. Yeah, I, I could see that. Where we once you've drawn that, I, that, I that know, parallel. I don't know if I said magical or innocent or or um or if it's just naive or childlike or what it is. Um, well, naive and childlike, definite, but innocent. I would take I would take issue with because she's. She's in on this murder. They, the son is upset with his mother and he is, he's being threatened by the local, uh, the local drug Lord. And, um, the mother has used his Coke two ounces. Um, and she's thrown him out of his house. Now he owes money. Um, and he figures, Let's kill mom for the insurance money. But he's too stupid to understand what kind of a trap he has fallen into, what he has stepped into. He's he's not playing chess. He's moving one he's moving half half a step ahead. He's not he's not even close to being on the board. <laughs> you know what I mean? This guy this kid's a fucking moron. And his father's a dimwit. His stepmother is a whore that Thomas is Thomas in church. Thomas and he's great in it too. He I mean is. Th this is for me, it's sad that a film can be this good and people would not, people's, um, certain, people's moral sensibilities would stop them from enjoying this film. This is a slice of life type of film. It's a character study that is very true to the, to the world that it is, um, depicting. I look at this film and I'm like, if you've ever, and my, my parents are big fans of reenactment TV, Sergeant Joe Kenda, shit like that, where, you know, that, that, that Sergeant was like, if you kill, I will catch you. <laughs> it's just no, all bad. That, uh, oh, it's the fucking, it's the fucking worst. But they watch shows like, um, uh, fear thy neighbor, uh, deadly women. They, they watch, they watch hours and hours every week on these, these reenactments of people killing other people for, for petty, for petty reasons or for insurance money. Now to a reasonable, rational human being, you would watch Killer Joe and say, Jesus Christ, how can you be that fucking stupid? Well, the fact is that there are people that are that fucking stupid. Yeah, you you would think how how is it that they have what's up like I want to know the <laughs> ratio of like births to murders because <laughs> yeah. there's all these shows that happen they they air every night 
several times a night about different people being killed mm -hmm. by their wives and their husbands and their blah blahs, um, and it's just kind of like how many people are fucking being murdered every day? Yeah. In in the United States, just alone, um, and you know, or, or what are the numbers on this? Because it's um, you can just, I mean, obviously. It's what books and magazines and shows and movies are made of. Um, but it, it just kind of, you know, my mom likes Dateline and all that. And I'm, and I'm, I'm just kind of like, <laughs> yeah, I'll ask her. Invariably, if I come over in the evening, it's it's one of a few things, and that's on the list, right? And yeah. and it's like, oh, was it the wife or the husband, or the girlfriend or the boyfriend? Yeah. Um, and then she'll laugh, and then it it's all of them, you know. Um. Yeah. But going back to Dottie, the innocence. I mean, that's her story arc. Is kind of. She's innocent, as a as a character trait. But she's not innocent in terms of the plot because That's she starts off yeah. innocent, um, but she's corrupted. It's kind of like The Exorcist. Um, it's like, well, Reagan is innocent, but Pazuzu is not innocent. And what happens when Reagan is possessed by Pazuzu? Um or let me not use passive voice. What happens when Pazuzu possesses Reagan? Um, uh, is that Reagan? Um, but you see with Dottie, innocent, corrupted, complicit, once she agrees, are you going to kill my mama? And why does she even agree? It's like, well, her mom tried to kill her. Yeah. Um, and then ultimately, you know, spoiler alert, you've been warmed, warned. Oh, we warned um, you way at the beginning of this fucking episode. Way at the so, beginning. Just, you know. so the point is, she's she's the one in, in, you see someone dead in the film, but the only person you see killing, actually killing in the film is her. Yeah. And she kills her family. Very, it's very interesting to note that she kills only her family. She doesn't kill her stepmother. Right. She kills her brother. She kills her father. She was in on the idea of killing her mother. She's, um... A lot of people would say, well... Well, some, some people would say this is like a, a feminist taking back her, her power kind of moment. Um... I wouldn't reduce it to something like that. I would just simply say this is a character who has been pushed to a certain point where she can't come back from. Where the all the only logical conclusion is to continue moving forward in this in this in this way in which murder is the the solution. I yeah, I mean and and, and You. And if someone's going to make the argument that that it's uh, like a, a feminist moment, it's whether you, I mean, it's, I'm not going to sit here and say, well, I'm, I'll be the judge of that. Um, but I, what I will do is say that there you can say that if the person consciously is saying this is a feminist moment, I'm taking back my fucking power. Fuck you. Um, die. And, and then shoots. Yeah. Um, or at that point, you are basically to make your point, not yours, but whoever would be making that point is now projecting that onto that character and then 
saying this is why. Um, so in the absence of a this is why, um, we don't have that argument. Um, because you would have to have an argument that makes sense. Um, and I'm not saying that there isn't one. I'm just saying that we don't have that because I'm not presenting it as that. You're not presenting it as that. No. Um, so it's maybe you could make it, but it, it's I don't I don't see that in this case. I I, I don't see um, I don't see a character who really um, you can say that she's is she coming into her own or whatever. I don't know. It sounds more like what you're saying is that there is a sense of a breaking of the cycle. There is a sense of consciously or unconsciously it's just like it's gotten so fucking bad this is this is so out of control that the best thing to do is just for everyone to just die at this point point. and as you said specifically it's her father and her brother and then she's pointing it at Joe and you see her move her finger back towards the trigger She's just told Killer Joel that she's pregnant. But the film ends. So you don't... You don't know what happens. You're left with either... She kills him or she doesn't. What happens then? Um, and I... I I think it's all the better that it, that that doesn't happen. That you don't have a solid conclusion. Well, I love ambiguous endings. I love an ending that leaves you up in the air. That it it because the story the story closes out. The story makes sense. It 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 has a logical ending to it, and yet you know I'm reminded of um, when Deadwood was canceled and David Milch lost the the chance to to finish out the series in its original run he was talking about the film and he was like there are no such things as endings not really there's a yes there is an ending to a story but the world that you've created exists and those lives continue on And I've come to embrace that idea. I mean, that that's the gist of what Milch said. Um, you can see it on, on one of the documentaries on, on the box set, uh, on the Deadwood box set. I think it was on the, when he closed out the third season. But it's true. There is a world that is there now in a sense. And I'm not talking about the need for a sequel. I'm talking about the realities of, of life. There is a setup for the next adventure. Where else could this story go? And that's a staple of, of this type of film. I mean, you, it's in a weird way. It's kind of like uh, uh, it's kind of like Travis Bickle looking in the mirror, um, in the rearview mirror at the end of Taxi Driver, where all of a sudden there's that there's that Bernard Herrmann um, sound cue. And you see that Travis snaps a little bit. And the, there's a part of you that knows. There's more, there's more to this. This is the story that we have up until this point, And this is, what, this is all that we need as far as that's concerned. But the story may be over. The lives are not. And right. I think that's a really interesting choice. I think that's, a, you know, instead of wrapping everything up with a bow... It's just letting you know exactly how fucked up things are. And Killer Joe 2 would be just as fucked up. Yeah. But it's not um, necessary, you know? It's not necessary. It's not. Um, yeah. Let's talk about the character. Joe? Joe. It's weird how... Um, this is a guy, 
He's introduced to the story because the Emil Hirsch character gets it in his head that he wants to, he wants to have his mother killed in order to collect a fifty thousand dollar life insurance policy, um, and I love the way that plays out in the story because you, you, when you hear how that plays out in the story, you get a real sense of how stupid this character is. Um, yeah, the manipulation involved in it from, from uh, the mother's boyfriend and and how that uh, the mother's uh, side boyfriend, not the, the dad. No, yeah, the mother's side boyfriend, not not Thomas Hayden Church, and um, he's given the name of a cop of a Dallas detective who moonlights as a killer, and for a certain amount, he will ki- he will kill somebody for you. Now, they have it in their head that they'll collect the money and pay Joe out from there. Anybody who knows this type of situation based on these movies, you, you know it doesn't work that way. A killer wants his money. He wants it immediately. What's oh, interesting uh, yeah. in this film is that he decides to take a retainer, which is the sister, Dottie. Dottie. And that that alone, you know, it's, it's very interesting because if Matthew McConaughey was not a good-looking man, Right. If if Friedkin had gone with his his original choice, his original Which choice was? for this role was Tommy Lee Jones. What the fuck? Yes, yes, it would have been a completely <laughs> different film. I it would not have worked in the way this works. But there's a part of me that would love to see the alternate universe <laughs> where Tommy Lee Jones plays Killer Joe. Wow. That was his original choice, but Friedkin saw some tape of, 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 I don't know where he's, what he saw, um, McConaughey in, but he, he talked Tracy Letts into rewriting the character as much younger. That would have been it's fucking crazy. Like yeah. seeing Black, Black Snake Mold. <laughs> Did you ever see that movie? Are you kidding me? You're asking me if I've ever seen Black... Yeah, motherfucker, I've seen Black Snake, Mo. <laughs> I'm going to ask the listener, have you ever seen that movie? Not, I, I doubt... Samuel... I, seeing as I was the only one in the fucking theater, <laughs> I I have a feeling that that was a, across the board and across the country, yeah. Tell us what Black Snake, Mo. I, I want to go on this... I, now I'm taking the wheel off <laughs> over somebody's yard. Black, Black Snake, Snake Mo is what? Black Snake Mode is about a young woman who is afflicted with the disease of nymphomania. She is fuck. She is fucking and sucking her way through the Mississippi Delta, or at least this small community that she lives in. She's fucked up. She ends up getting <sighs> raped. I guess, or used and thrown off of a truck in the middle of a, uh, in the middle of a dirt road that leads to Samuel L. Jackson's property. And he finds her and starts to nurse her back to health. Now he knows who she is. He's aware of, of, of her, her reputation as basically the town slut. Spoiler when she alert, all of this. Yeah. When she comes <laughs> when she comes to, she's like, Thank you. I appreciate it, but I gotta leave. And that's when she realizes she's chained to his radiator. And he she and runs. She huh? Oh, Christina Ricci. Hey. Christina Ricci is this Christina character. Christina Ricci chained to Christina to Ricci's character. Little white to Christina Jackson's Ricci's <laughs> Little radiator. White Christina Ricci. Tied, chained to Samuel L. Jackson's radiator in some sharecroppers or what once was some sharecroppers shack somewhere in Mississippi. And he's going to beat or, or he's going to exercise the evil out of her. Okay. <laughs> now you see how you, you see listener. How part of you, there's a part of you, an evil fucking part of you, just with the ridiculousness of it, just the visual, like, awkwardness of it, everything that makes you want to laugh a little bit. 
but at the same time you feel disgusted and you feel like this is fucked up like yeah. what are you what this is a movie what what yeah now we can transfer back into the realm of killer joe well and that's the and thing that's the thing black snake the moon is very funny in a lot of respects but i don't think it's meant as a comedy killer joe is written as a comedy this is a dark black comedy it's this a is very a very dark comedy this is yeah. a very dark comedy this is a comedy where where you're watching it thinking to yourself my God. i mean if there's any question to whether or not this movie is meant to be funny there's a moment in the middle of the film, probably 40, 45 minutes into the film, where the Emil Hirsch character, Chris, is running from the local thugs who he owes money to. And the the head of this crime family, Digger, I mean, I don't know if it's a yeah. family, but it's always a crime family. Digger, whatever his name is, drives up in his red pickup and the soundtrack and the music playing in the truck it's Clarence Carter Strokin. Now, if you've yeah. ever heard Strokin, <laughs> it's one of the yeah. great fucked up songs of the 1970s, 1980s. I don't remember. But but it, Clarence Carter, Mississippi, M- M- Muscle Shoals, Alabama, blind guitarist, Strokin. And they proceed to beat the shit out of Chris's char- the Chris character while Strokin plays in full over the soundtrack. At first, it's just ambient music off of coming out of the truck. Friedkin puts it on the soundtrack and it's fucking, I remember watching it laughing my ass off. And I think it was, I think it was one of those moments, much like when we went to see the Iceberg Slim movie where you're You're laughing at the most, yeah, we're the only, we motherfucker, we, not, not you were the only one laughing. We. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, but they can't hear me laughing. (laughs) Good point. Good point. <laughs> um, well, you're hearing the because most ridiculous shit. Because hear you. Huh? <laughs> In any given situation, yeah. On any given Sunday, yeah, they're going to hear me. They're going to, it's going to drown everything out. But I remember watching that laughing my ass off because I know the song, stroke at Clarence Carter, but don't stroke so fast. If my stuff's not tight enough, you can stick it up my stroke it. <laughs> yeah. I've had the pleasure of having you sing that at my karaoke ah, birthday party. Yeah, that's uh, the one that gets you invited back. Um, <laughs> but you see it on the screen, and then to end the movie with that over the the, the credits. I just, I mean, Friedkin is a Friedkin and Tracy Letts are some sick bastards. <laughs> there is there is a level of depravity that goes into the making of a movie like this that, that make, goes into no let's be honest that goes into the making of this movie because there's there's very few other films like this i can't think yeah. of too many yeah, films that it, go to this place because there's um Gina Gershon has a film where she's uh, in a rock band um okay and I don't remember what it's called, um, but I feel like there's this kind of uh, like revenge. Um, it kind of reminds me of, and I don't know if I'm conflating. Um, I feel like there's a revenge scene against. Um, some kind of abusive person, a kind of like a like a like a um, girl with the dragon tattoo type scene. Mm. Um, I don't know this film. I'm, I'm not familiar I, with this film. I, I, I'm for some reason either I'm creating this or whatever. But the fact is that in this film, um, you don't have a scene that really avenges the scene that we're going to talk about the most outrageous um abusive scene in the film um which is the 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 chicken scene the chicken leg scene Mm -hmm. um in the process of uh and matthew mcconaughey refers and we're still we're talking about all this but we're still talking about the character he decides that he's going to take this 
Dottie, this girl who, is she 12 in the film? Does she say she's 12? She says it during the, during, during the couple life. scene, during that, during that first yeah. date where, where McConaughey takes her from behind, where he, he, she, he takes her as a retainer because they can't afford, they can't pay the $25,000, um, fee for his, and for refers his services. to her as his retainer. Yeah. She's an object. He's like, that's my retainer. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't even know if, she, if he says she's my retainer or he just says that's my retainer. I think he says that's. It's so, so impersonal. She's, it's she's so, an object. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they agree. And not only do they agree, but you get this, this idea that, well, maybe it would be good for her, actually. Um, it would be an improvement, almost. From it, It's like an upgrade. It's like the best to bad become, choice, yeah. To become Killer Joel's retainer, to be his property, pending the, this payout. Yeah. Um, because, and this is the thing, too, um, Killer Joe, the way he's he walks into the room, the way he walks onto the screen, he's they're all fucked up. Yeah. But he's the one that is the most functional. He's the one that has his shit together. Well, he's a sociopath. He's yeah, he's got the I don't know if you're familiar with the dark triad. No. Um, Mm -mm. there's this idea of the of these three traits that create the dark triad personality and um some people say that you know a lot of fictional characters have them james bond um that allow them Mm -hmm. to behave you know james bond is able to he sleeps with all these women that he ends up getting them killed he kills people that's his that's his thing is to go kill people. Yeah. It's that, um, that's separate that being able to separate yourself from humanity thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, dark triad is narcissism, Machiavellianism and psychopathy. So narcissism, this grandiose self-centeredness, um, it's all about me. Um, you know, a, kind of like a Trump type of, uh, yeah personality where it's it, it's you are the center of the universe you are the focus beyond what normally like obviously everyone is going through life as like the hero in their story um but to such a, a, a an exaggerated and an extreme degree machiavellianism machiavelli was a 15th century florentine writer he wrote the prince about political strategy and manipulation so to be able to use other people, manipulate situations, um, people become chess pieces for your game, Machiavellianism, psychopathy, superficial charm, plus no no remorse, also uses others, able to abuse people without feeling any empathy for them, etc. So the dark triad, um, he has, he, he's that kind of character where he can do all this fucked up shit, but on the surface looks kind of like an American, did you see American Psycho? Have you seen that? No. Um, it's okay, sitting there on my shelf, it. but I, I know the, I know well, the film. Point, yeah. Yeah. At some point we'll see the, and, and, you know, and that book is funny too. Um, mm-hmm. they, you know, uh, Brett Easton, El- Easton Ellis, um, uh, the one episode ago or however many episodes ago, I talked about Robert Green, 48 laws of power. Well, he has his, his main trilogy is 48 laws of power, art of seduction and 33 strategies of war. Robert Green's website is called Power Seduction, www.powerseductionandwar.com. It's a great title because it's those three of his earliest books. 
that's basically like Killer Joe's website, Power, Seduction, and War. Um, he's a killer, but he's a cop. He's always controlled, very polite. He's handsome. Matthew McConaughey is handsome. He's charming. Um, he's the person who can refer to this adolescent or teenage girl as his retainer. That's my retainer. Um, but at the same time, sit and have this homemade dinner with her that she's made of tuna casserole and asks her, may I serve? Yeah. He can set up this abusive stage in the middle of the kitchen at the climax of the film and still talk about saying grace. There are moments when his rage, they leak out. Well, they don't leak out, they, they burst they out. They explode out, um, yeah. Um, but, but he's always controlled. And the, the, the thing about this kind of movie is like you see all these fucked up characters and then you, you don't know what you're watching. You see Killer Joe come in and it's kind of like, oh, this guy's cool. Sure. Um, and, you know, there are people out there um, probably within the manosphere, red pill, incel, fucking dungeon, dungeons of the internet that they think that that this is the this is the he's the shit. You know the people who like Andrew the Andrew Tates of the world, but without the just stupid internet bravado, um, yeah. Killer Joe is smooth. Killer Joe always looks sharp. Killer Joe is successful. Killer Joe gets the girl. <laughs> You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> he's, he, he's toxic as fuck. You know, the, the idea of toxic masculinity, this is toxic masculinity. Um, but in a way that, think about a pimp. You know, it's interesting that uh, you bring that up because I was watching, I just finished watching HBO's The Deuce, which is about the sex trade in 1970s into, into 80 from about 71 into 85 in New York times square and the profile of the pimps and, um, the way they control the situation. And it's like, there was, you know, there was a certain fascination with that level of smoothness with how someone like that operates and justifies their behavior. Uh, I don't know if Killer Joe knows he's evil, but it's definitely. I don't think there. he thinks about "Am I evil?" No, you know what I mean. It's just kind of like if you read about not to cut you off, but if you read about these types of um, these types of people are not concerned with yeah. where they fall on this this moral spectrum or or what you know. No, they their shit is like I'm here to achieve my goals and and almost this idea of like, well, wait, everyone is like this. Everyone's just it's a, and it, it's like it's like an extreme form of uh like Ayn Rand libertarian uh where it's like everyone's just self um, self motivated to the extent that fuck everyone else um, and if you're not then it's well that's your fault kill or be killed um, if you're not trying to get yours then you then someone else will get yours and so that's just the way it is and I don't care I don't care about, am I, I'm too busy enjoying my life. I'm too busy doing my thing to worry about, 
am I evil? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that it's just, these things don't, these things do not make their heart beat faster or their stomach upset or give them like a tension headache or um, they sleep soundly. They don't feel that. They're, they're a different, they're made differently. Um, and he's that type of character. And how he switches to, once she has the gun on him, he switches, he's like, you, the, the, there's, in that climax, there's the, um, the power struggle between Chris and Killer Joe as to whether Dottie's going to leave with Chris to escape or she's going to leave with, with Killer Joe. Yeah. And it's like, Dottie, go change. Dottie, sit down. Dottie, Dottie, Dottie. And it's just so fucked up. And, and we, we've been wanting to do this thing about violence against women for a long time. Yeah. Um, I mean, that sounds weird. But, uh, we've been wanting to do this thing about violence against women. But um, we've been wanting to talk about that subject. Um, and we've talked about how, or we've mentioned how as we've seen it for the most part, and you tell me if, it, you know, fix or, or adjust whatever I'm saying, or, or tell me if, 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 you, if you, however you disagree or whatever, but at least my interpretation is that as we've seen it for the most part, if a female character in a film, or this is the tendency, if a female character in a film does kind of get some kind of come up or some kind of like get back or some kind of vengeance and I get it in order to get vengeance something must have happened to you in order to get that that's that's built into it but if it's a guy it's never as extreme as it is with a woman and of course it's well, like well with the woman there's always going to be some kind of sexual violence and degradation and that's the, thing. the original the original idea behind that um it came out of Kill Bill. If you remember when I was talking to you about that, the the, the we spark also of haven't it, talked about yet. We haven't. No, the original idea, uh, the spark that ignited that idea was the bride character not only had to be betrayed by her her friends and her her crew, her team, but she had to endure seven years of constant rape being her 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 coma body her body in a coma being prostituted for seven years and i remember watching that film thinking this is fucking extreme and this is very tarantino and i remember being in a weird way offended not in I, the sensibilities i'm not offended by the subject matter i'm offended by the idea that somebody could say this is an empowerment film this is this is a feminist movie because you know the 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 old the the constant saying is she takes her power back and she gains her control but in every film like this it just seems from from um what do you call it uh uh i spit on your grave yeah through Kill Bill, a woman has to be sexually assaulted in the most violent, horrible way. Now, you can sit here and you can say, well, wait a minute, didn't you just say about Gina Gershon's character? Well, yeah. It's there. It's it's a horrible scene. And, and, and I think this plays into that idea because, um, you know, the Dottie character... She is abused. She's abused by everybody. She's abused by her father. She's abused by her brother, her stepmother, her mother. Um, Killer Joe comes into the picture and he's charming. And yet he is still abusive. This is a this is an abused, abusive char 
This is yeah, an abused he's taking character. ownership of her. Yeah. And um, and and at that point, and because the whole thing is that she's a virgin. Um, you know that's that's an age old yeah mark right um, and so now she's more prized because she's a virgin um, and well and all of the different things that that means um, as to why that someone a female would be prized for that. Um, and so now he enters into uh, an abusive, exploitive sexual relationship with her, but she falls in love with him. And he claims that he's fallen in love with her. He claims that they have fallen in love and now they're going to get married. Um, and he's taking her. But first, he needs to... Because he's because he's killed the mom. Yeah. Now he does all that with Dottie, and then the scene. He find the they. It's we all figure out that Chris got played by Gina Gershon's boyfriend, and Gina Gershon is in on it. Yeah. The way that plays out is exceptionally well handled as well. I like the way that, I mean, it's just, yeah. you know, you see the same car in two different scenes and you're like, oh, shit, okay. You know she's a whore. You don't know she's uh, she's playing in that way, though. You can anticipate, and, but, yeah. Yeah. And so what he does is he he punches her full on and breaks in, he break in the face and breaks her nose. Yeah. And that's already like, whoa. Um, repeatedly grabs her by the throat and, and describes how if she disrespects him, he'll, he'll fucking murder her right then and there. But he's also saying, I didn't speak to you that way. Remember? Yeah. I didn't. I didn't insult you. It's fuck. It's a fucking yeah. hard scene to watch. And he, he takes a, a, a chicken leg, and it's the most bizarre. And it and it's like right dead. It's right here at the climax of this dark comedy. And, and it's not funny. No, it's not funny. <clears throat> and and I'm I mean I'm not saying it to um to kind of uh show everyone I'm not trying to virtual signal and say like look No, guys, we're not sitting here as masculine feminists. I'm, we're not doing that. Not in any way. That plus whatever. Whatever yeah. however you want to describe it or take it, it's like um no, it's just not it's it is what it is and we are describing it in in pretty graphic detail in graphic enough um for the purposes of our conversation um but it's not funny um do i think that well before we get to that what happens he makes her simulate oral sex on him but with the chicken leg and as she's doing it, he's acting out. He's simulating receiving oral sex to the point of climax. I don't think he's simulating. I think he's really getting off on it. I think I think he's coming. Yeah. Okay. So. So. Yeah. So. But the the, the fact is that. She's not going down on him. No. She's going down on the leg, the yeah. chicken leg. But he's acting like she's going down on him. But now you're adding the layer of he's actually receiving pleasure from that beyond mental. He's he's actually coming from her sucking on that leg. Um, that's the person that 
in the beginning of the film, the danger is that the viewer is going to say, this is the guy who's cool. This is the... Um, and I'm not used also just I'm not doing this as just like a kind of like morality tale of like beware. Um, it, it's just this is how fucked up it is. Is that you you're looking at someone in the beginning of the film that's like this is the one who you know he's a killer, but at the same time he's the one that in the chaos of all the other characters this is the one that has it together. So you're drawn to that person as a form of stability, as a character who who is in control who gives a contrast and then now the contrast to the contrast is at the end of the film you have that's that person that moment is really important for the culmination of the film in in, in your under the, I can't say that there is a there is an arc to the character but there is an arc to our understanding of the character for for yeah. us for us, what we right. actually see is what we months may have admired in the coolness, the charisma, the or style, and the good looking. Maybe even, even have been drawn to without admiring, just yes. kind of like our eye is drawn to him, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Now you realize like, what like, he actually is. And I, and I got to say, um, it's a disturbing scene, but it's also a scene that I think a lot of people can, and this is the danger of art. I think a lot of people can take the wrong lesson from that. I don't remember. I don't remember if people were laughing during that scene. That see, that's the thing is like I can't remember. That, that's that's what's that's what's interesting is like we're saying that that's the scene that isn't funny. Yeah. Um. So much of it is fucking. It's dark comedy throughout. But yeah. this is when the shit gets. Yeah, it's real. Yeah, where it's like, well, yeah, you were laughing, but now you're not laughing. Now you're you're not laughing anymore, are you? You're not. But then there are going to be those people that are like, "What the fuck is this? What am I watching?" And they're not laughing at all. And then maybe they get to this point, and it's so fucking weird, and it's so whatever that that's the release of the tension is that. It just becomes so ridiculous that that's when they laugh and they don't even know why they're laughing. Well, one of the big laughs in the film, and I think I think it's a testament to Friedkin in his in his ability to read a scene and um, develop it and tell the story to its conclusion. I think he knows his audience needs to release that valve. And so, what does he do when he when he has that last? You've seen Gina Gershon humiliated on screen the way she is. It's fucking brutal. I I, I don't know where she got the strength to do it as an actor. I don't. I, that's a fucking rough scene to do. I can't imagine. I I can see why she wouldn't do it on stage, where she couldn't find it in herself to do that on stage. I don't. I don't. I don't fault her in any way on that. Um. But when Chris comes to the home in order to take his, his sister and the ensuing battle goes between him and Killer Joe and they're beating the shit out of each other and he's got him up against the, he's got him up against the refrigerator he's beating the, he's hitting him in right. the face with a can <laughs> and Thomas Hated Church lunges at his legs and says, I got him, I got him Joe, I got him. <laughs> I don't remember. I remember that being a huge laugh, and I think it was because everything that came before it was so fucking uncomfortable. It's one of the biggest laughs that I've ever heard in a theater. Just that, that, that. <laughs> I think the audience needed it. They fucking and, needed and, it. And Gina Gershon is 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 like cheerleading for Joe, the yeah. guy who just. Did all of this assault, raped and battery, her. He basically and raped sexual her. Yeah. abuse? Yes, yeah. yeah. She's cheering for him to kill Chris. Yeah. Um. And <laughs> and you're going, what the fuck? Yeah, and you're just, just yeah. when you were describing it, yeah. I'm laughing. Yeah. yeah. It's like how the fuck um, did this just? And then, you know, she, Dottie gets a hold of that gun. She shoots. She shoots her brother in the shoulder, and then 
Does she shoot him in the chest or the head? I don't, I, no, she shoots... The, he's so fucking bloody that it's hard to tell what's what. Shoots her father in the stomach. Hilarious. You're yeah. watching, you're, you're screaming. Gershon is hiding behind his body and trying to comfort him at the same time. And she tells Killer Joe, I'm pregnant. And that look of, that look of, of happiness that comes over Joe. And then you cut to black... And boom, I'd be stroking. <laughs> That's what I'd be doing. <laughs> I remember I remember that being just like, the audience was, it was a great what the fuck moment. Are you kidding me? It's, it's, I don't think I'm going to, given the material and what it is, and this is pulp, this is low grade, this is slumming. On everybody's part. But they do it so beautifully. It's a slum masterpiece. I, I would consider I, I consider it a great film. I would consider it one of the best films of of that decade. Of definitely that year. And I wish more people would see it. Hmm? In terms of the the family dynamic and, and the fact that it's a play, it's and to say pulp, I mean it's kind of It's slumming on the in the tradition of Tennessee Williams. If that's slumming, yes, you know? yes, absolutely. Um, it's 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 exceptional slumming. It's it's a film that has no right to be as good as it is. It's low life characters, stupid characters, evil characters, committing horrible acts. There is nothing redeeming about this film. The but but what but what elevates the film itself is the quality of the writing, the beauty of the acting, and Friedkin's directing. Friedkin gets you from point A to point B, and he delivers in every way, pacing, the tension. He takes you to very dark places. This could very well be his darkest film. When we watched Cruising, we saw... You and I talked about this, and we saw... I said, and you agreed, that... It was a fascinating look at the underbelly of one aspect of a society, but it had no true understanding of that world that it was depicting. But it was fascinating to see it. Yeah, it was like a, it was like um, if William Friedkin, if there was like a William Friedkin land <laughs> that was like like a like an like an analog, analog to Disneyland. Yeah, and. And you have all these like big rides, yeah. Like The Exorcist is this huge ride. Uh, Sorcerer is in Adventureland. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, um, French Connection is a big ride. Yeah. In Fantasyland, you have Cruising, and it's kind of like these little um, Mr. Toad's Adventure or Snow White. They're like really short rides. Mm-hmm. And you just, you get into this little cramped car and you just go through this these little scenarios. Um, and they get really dark and really fucked up. And then, then it's over. Yeah. And you don't, you just kind of like just <coughs> drove by it. That's cruising. Yeah. Um, it wasn't like this huge immersive thing it was just kind of it wanted to be but it was just kind of like a little drive-by um well thing. What, what we talked like those about drive-by pumpkin patches that you that you go through what, in halloween what we talked about during the discussion of that film is that where it failed is that it never gave you a true understanding of the people that went to these places it was it was gratuitous because it didn't humanize it in any way. I'm not saying that it should sympathize with it. What I'm saying is that it should it should have depicted that world in a way that would show why somebody would would want to go into it. What is the psychology of it? Where Killer Joe works is that it's it's all about the psychology of it. You see these people 
you see desperation, you see greed, you see um, just just evil characters, and you understand what it is. You understand what these characters are motivated by and why they live the way they do. Um, it's a very human film in that, in that sense, because it gives a face to those stories that you've heard, to those Dateline episodes that your mom watched, to the real TV that my mom and dad watch. It's, it's, um, it's filling in the blanks in a way that I, I've never seen before. And, and. Go ahead. No, no. What I was going to say was it was incredibly brave on every participant's part, especially Matthew McConaughey, because McConaughey, McConaughey's career is based on this pretty boy rom-com image. Um, to play a character this dark and irredeemable, my God, he went to some weird places. This could have shut down everything for him. Maybe it would have if anybody had seen it. But it came right before his. He's he's made some big shit after. You know what I mean? Yeah, like it's the um, McConaughey. It's one of those things. What do they call it? The McConaug the McConaughey McConaughey or something? You know this yes, this right. year, two thousand eleven, yeah, the, the Renaissance of. Yeah, he did. He did the. He did the Lincoln Lawyer. He did this film, and he did a film called Bernie. Now, if you've never seen Bernie. That's one of his great performances because it's very real. It's very honest. He plays the DA in a small Texas, uh, small Texas city. And Jack Black pay, plays a man who befriends an old woman played by Shirley MacLaine, but she's very controlling. He's a closeted gay man. She's very controlling. She falls in love with him. He ends up killing her. And, um, McConaughey is the district attorney. And it's a very funny movie, but it's based on a real life case. And it was directed by Richard Linkletter. If you've never seen that, watch mm. this film, watch that, and you'll see the total range of Matthew McConaughey. And you'll be, I think you'll be blown away by it. I mean, you watch Dallas Buyers Club. That's obvious. Oh, yeah. That's a, it's a good film and it's a really good performance. And he went to, he went to really extreme lengths in the weight loss and the look and, and he's great in it. He deserved his Oscar, I think. Um, but the Wolf of Wall Street, that same the time Wolf period, of Wall he's Street, filming yeah. that. Yeah. Cause he had just come off of, cause you could see how thin he is in Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. So yeah. And he steals, he doesn't steal the movie exactly, but he steals that opening that first 30 minutes of the movie belongs to Matthew McConaughey for that one scene. Um, you're not thinking of anything else. And then, and then Scorsese hits you with a barrage of, of Scorsese isms and it, right. it just becomes this roller coaster ride. And it shows that that man still had, he still had a lot of fight in him. Um, I respect Matthew McConaughey as an actor. I think he's a damn good actor and I love seeing people take chances with roles like this. He's, he's, I will go see a Matthew McConaughey movie because I know he's probably going to be the best thing in it. I I was watching this and I was thinking about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah. And I was thinking about his character, Matthew McConaughey's character and Brad Pitt's character. Sure. I could see and, that correlation. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, handsome men, uh, to a certain extent, rugged, um, uh, once upon a time in the in Hollywood, more so, he's a stunt man, whatever. Um, uh, violence, depictions of violence of women in the film, in the climax, um, the possibility of labeling that character as all oh, this guy's fucking cool both psychopathic um both killers one it's your your you know Brad Pitt's character you're questioning did he kill his wife killer joe okay he's killer joe um 
the way he describes to Dottie as a police officer having to pull his gun and she's like, did they die? And he's like, um, something along the lines of some have. Um, you know, when she's asking, did they die? It's not necessarily plural. It's just kind of like, did that person potentially, um, he says it in plural. Some did something along those lines. But I think about these two films kind of like these parallels, and they're loose parallels, but what I think about, I think about how in Tarantino's story, and they're different stories, so they're, as I say, loose parallels, so you can't completely, I get it if you're not buying into what I'm saying because I'm holding something against Tarantino in the sense because... Um, He turns it into a character where you have this character who is, there's a charisma there, there's the looks, there's the coolness, there's a whatever, but that person becomes the definite hero of that film. Because now you're dealing with this guy with the Manson family, and they're the fucking fuck-ups of that film that he is fucking up and you're rooting for this guy Brad Pitt's character and you're 100% rooting for his dog um, and it's like at any point is anyone saying like this guy's fucked up too like take a step back Versus in Killer Joe, they don't make it about how Killer Joe is. He may be cool, he may be this, he may be that, but he's not heroic. He's an ugly character, and Friedkin and Letts and McConaughey and the rest of the cast that are working on this story show you that. And they show you how fucked up that world is, how fucked up the family is, how fucked up people potentially can be. And they go to great lengths to really get you to laugh and fucking take a step back and be disgusted. It's so much deeper um than something like once upon a time in hollywood yeah which takes which is based on obviously the manson murder murders and the murder of sharon tate um and the others um and it does a good job of showing charles manson in the light in a different light and showing his family as these fuck ups but then it kind of just basically transfers the mystique and the charm the charisma that maybe people think of Charles Manson as a controller and puts it onto Brad Pitt's character is that right is it wrong I don't know that it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, that's just how I, I see it. And for all of that, I think um, I think Tarantino made a movie. We talked about it, but I think there's also so, something about it that he's being cute. Um, and yeah, those scenes with Brad Pitt are good scenes. They're, they look good. They're whatever. Uh, the stuff that he does with Bruce Lee and all that shit that you know and that that Tarantino fantasy and all that that's a different thing but as fucked up as toxic as whatever 
whatever you want to call Killer Joe, as much of that 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 is, it's more honest in all of its extremes, in all of its exaggerations. And uh, honest is not always the best, necessarily, for a film. But in this case, for the world that it creates, it's real. It's about as real as you're going to fucking get. Well, it definitely works for me. I was I watched the film and I I, I was blown away by um, the skill of everything, the story, the writing, where it took me, the performances, Friedkin's directing, knowing that Friedkin was almost almost eighty when he directed this film. Um, he was probably seventy six, seventy seven years old. I mean, that's this is much more of a young man's film, and it's tight. They couldn't have had a whole lot of money. And Friedkin just attacks the material. It's it's as skillful as The French Connection or or To Live and Die in L.A. or Sorcerer. I mean, it's just, it's up there with, with, with his great films. And I think it's difficult for a lot of people because it is so lurid. This is not easy material this is not an, e- an easy viewing experience but if you love movies i i don't see how you cannot embrace this film let me ask you before we close out yeah. let me ask you just as quickly as we can do it mm-hmm. um w- after saying all that we've said what is the point of the chicken scene. <clears throat> is it, is it, could it have, I mean, did you have, did he have to go to those extremes in the scene? Or is it just, you know, the head spinning, Reagan's head fucking spinning, the doll, the rotating head? Like, is it just, is it just a prop to be extreme? No. No, I'll say it this, I'll say it the best I can say. Friedkin knows, there's two different schools of thought on this. I, well, there's two different of my own, my own schools, is that that was the script. Uh, right. It's a okay. demonstration of the level of evil of this character, of a contrast between the charm and, and what he is capable of. Kurosawa once said that if you're going to, if you're going to shoot a storm, make it hurricane winds. Mm. You know, that, that final, that final fight in, um, seven samurai, it didn't have to happen in the rain. It was but the rain was the rain elevated the power of it. Not only are these samurai who have been chopped down to four, I think four, maybe five, not only have they lost men, but they're they're fighting bandits and they're fighting nature. It's coming at them from all angles. It's an extreme thing. You've gone out of your way to create this character that is, for all intents and purposes, an evil character. But when you see that, it makes it a little bit more personal. It makes it, 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 he didn't have to do what he did, but the story had to have it because you had to understand the level of depravity of this character. You had to understand what this man was truly capable of and what he was willing to do. Now, the second school is you have somebody as charismatic, as good looking, and as, um, appealing as Matthew McConaughey. You see him do this, and you see, and I got, and I got to give it to McConaughey for selling it the way he does. You're disgusted by him at the end. I was, and you least. take him seriously. Yeah, you take it very seriously, and that's why I think it's necessary. I don't think it's gratuitous. I think it was. I think it made sense as difficult as it was to watch as p- 
pain. It's, it's, I, I'm not going to say painful, but I, as I, I can imagine a woman would have a much harder time watching this scene than me for many obvious reasons. <clears throat> but that doesn't negate the idea that um, the character has to go to that place in order for the story to be serviced. I fully, I fully support Tracy Letts, McConaughey, and Friedkin, and Gina Gershon, for that matter. Yeah, yeah. In their in their um, in their writing, direction, and performance of that of that scene. It's ugly. It's it's one of the worst rape scenes that I've ever seen on screen because of the novelty of it i don't know i don't the 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 weird kind of way it plays out the way it it's just it's horrible it's fucking horrible and then he has has her serve fucking yeah sides after yeah in the most calm matter of fact manner imaginable a great film an exclamation point on a great directing career. I thought it was I thought it was an amazing film. I, I I think it's a great film. That's my personal opinion. That being said, we've come to the end of this episode. We're glad that you guys could uh, join us. We're glad that you could uh, come and be with us week after week, listening to these 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 uh, these opinions, beliefs, ideas, and interpretations of cinema if you've listened to us over the years if you're new to the podcast you'd like to support us you can you can go to www.buymeacoffee.com slash watch rick ramos and there are a variety of of different um amounts that you can donate we appreciate anything and everything that you can give we're just trying to keep it going um we love what we do and we appreciate your support in both listening, um, recommending, reposting, and your donations. Thank you so much, Mr. Chavez. Is there anything you would like to leave the audience with? Yeah, just send us fucking money. Like, cut the <laughs> bullshit. Just send us fucking money. <laughs> what a charmer you, know you are. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be back next week with uh, new movies. Bye-bye now. <laughs>